Hello, everybody, and welcome to a podcast, a special podcast that that I am doing. I'm Digibro, and I'm joined by my buddy, Econ. Hello there. Econ, you are, you are perhaps best known to the internet as a guy who made a video shitting on me for 15 <laughs> minutes. Um, what, but it was, was from it 15 a, minutes? I, something like that. Something like that. From a place of... of uh, from a place of love, though, I would say. Oh yeah. Maybe definitely. that maybe that wasn't apparent to everybody who watched it, but we are <laughs> we we're we're pals, we're buddies, we've hung out a number of times in person. Um. Anyway, that's not relevant to this. I just <laughs> thought I'd. What, what? How would you describe yourself? Uh. So that people don't just know you as the guy who I perplexingly seem to hang out with even though he made video <laughs> shitting on me for 15 minutes well well first of all I, I think that there's this sort of misunderstanding here you have to really care about somebody to shit on them that aggressively right like like you you want to you know go out and berate a child if it wasn't your own child you know you want to be like bad billy bad or bad dog or whatever sure, somebody else's, right? but most most of the people who make videos shitting on me for 15 minutes i don't like so that's fair that's fair <laughs> <laughs> But but you 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 surely have done other things um, on the internet mm. or in general that people might I don't know want to know about. Didn't you make some mod, some really popular mod for something? Uh, for Skyrim and Fallout and stuff like that. But that I I I, I wouldn't want people to know who I was in that case. Okay. <laughs> uh, I guess aside from that, I'm also probably one of the largest um, collectors of anime. Um, keyframes in the American Southeast, but okay. Aside from that, there's not much else to me. I don't have a much very big internet presence, unlike you. Such a, that's such a specific thing. This, this podcast would probably one like of... double double the size of whatever presence I have. Yeah, one of the biggest animation cell collectors of the Southeast United States. I guess that's still a pretty good accolade. <laughs> Is it accolade or accolade? Um, I don't know. I'm sure the anyways, British say it differently. Or some... What I know you for <laughs> best is that you love to argue, like, more than anyone I've ever known. And I come from a, f- I come from a line of arguers. <laughs> My mom is a big arguer. I'm a big arguer. I'm used to being in arguments. Some people can't take arguments. Some people hear an argument going on, and they're like, why are those guys so mad at each other? But it's not, it's not always that. Some of us just have this in our blood. We I have agree. this natural instinct, and uh, I think you have it more strongly than anyone I've ever known. Ah, don't be so, don't be so humble, did you? You're you're a pretty, pretty. I watch you argue every day, <laughs> every day. I see you arguing. Well, because you already have a goddamn outlet through like your videos and whatever. You That's know, uh, some of, some of us don't have that. You're probably like you you nutted. You've exerted yourself. You're. You are so eagerly arguing in your videos, you don't have the effort to argue with poor plebs like us anymore. And it's pronounced That's... pleb, not plebe, you goddamn pleb. I know that. <laughs> the, the plebe and the weeb is a joke, if you were wondering. Anyway, <laughs> anyways. Because it rhymes, and that makes it funnier. <laughs> so, I, I, I'll, I'll agree with that, and I'm here to give you a platform. I'm here to give you a place to argue in front of an audience. And I especially, I'm very curious, because you're someone who, who, um... You enjoy giving criticism a whole lot. You are always talking about how people should listen to criticism. And I think it'll be interesting to see how how people might respond to your arguments in this video and how you might respond to the criticism those people have of you as no, a result. No, as much as I love giving criticism, I, I take it too. I, I enjoy yeah. being criticized as well. I think the important part about criticism and arguing for that matter is that it, it – kind of puts your opinions through some sort of natural selection where the weak die out and the strong survive and what you're left yeah. with is like your previous beliefs in shambles and ripped apart and torn through but you know the strongest bits the strongest bits survive and those are the bits you can expand upon yeah if you if you never argue and you never challenge yourself and and a lot of people, it makes people uncomfortable, right? Because their beliefs and what they like and what they dislike, it becomes part of their identity. So when you argue with them, yeah. um, they take it as a personal insult because their beliefs are so important to them. I think that's I think that's the biggest difference between people who love to argue and people who don't is there's, that we can separate that a little bit more. 
Oh, like, yeah, definitely, definitely. Like, I don't take most of... Uh, something that's hard for me to explain in videos is that I don't take my opinions that seriously, and that's why I'm open to argue about them, you know? But, like, I don't know, it's hard to convince people I think, that I that's think that, true. <laughs> I think that's why people also call you a hypocrite sometimes, like, like you know, me. Um, oh, yeah, definitely. But <laughs> it's because, because I don't take my yeah, because opinions seriously opinions, enough to hold your on Your opinions to change so often that, like, yeah. you know... When, when you present yourself as identity online, people are like, oh, DJ says one thing and then he says another. But, you know, people change. Yeah. So anyways, um, that that's all just preamble. <laughs> Let's get into our actual fucking argument, which I'm going to need you to explain exactly what we're arguing about tonight. I was going to I was about to ask you that <laughs> we've had this on the back burner for like three weeks to a month or something like that. Yeah, we were arguing about Hayao Miyazaki. Um, I don't remember exactly, the tenor of the conversation was sort of that you believe that Miyazaki has grown stale and that he maybe is overrated I, or just doesn't deserve to I, be talked about as much. I think, I think, um, for, I think this was like stemmed from when you were talking about Ponyo and I think this mm -hmm. goes back, like if you want to really trace it back all the way to uh, when we were at Anime Expo, I think we have a discussion about this. Um, but I, I think at the beginning of an argument or a debate like this, uh, it's very important to clarify exactly what we're talking about. So, yeah. um, you know, the conversation doesn't keep changing tracks and whatever. Yeah. And also, so all the notes I take and don't go to waste. Uh, um, <laughs> I think, I believe, uh, at, at least from my perspective, what I believe we were going to talk about was, um... You were saying Miyazaki, you know, is fantastic, it's great, I think most people would agree yes. with you. And I was saying, I don't just think he deserves the praise that he gets, and I think yes. that idolizing him can be a very bad thing. Okay. So, my criticisms are that, uh, well, I think Miyazaki is overrated, and I think his works have a lot of unacknowledged flaws that people should look more closely at. Okay. I'll be very curious... I, I'm looking forward to your notes because I feel very differently. Oh yeah, and the reason I, I came the reason I came at this so hard that I wanted to do a podcast about it is that I'm sort of a new Miyazaki acolyte. Uh, was not a fan for most of my anime fan fandom. You know, I've been watching anime for over 15 years. I'd only seen Jesus Christ, nerd, get a life. Yeah, I'd only seen like uh, Spirited Away, and. Um, and I never really understood it growing up. Like, I'd seen it several times over the years and w wasn't that into it. Um, saw Princess Mononoke, but I was too young to even remember it till I rewatched it recently. Uh, the first one I saw that I actually kind of liked was Kiki's Delivery Service. And other than that, I hated Castle in the Sky. Uh, and it wasn't until a couple of years ago when The Wind Rises came out. And I saw that, and, like, a combination of seeing that, Ponyo... Rewatching some of the old ones, suddenly I was like a huge fan, and so now, suddenly I'm like, find myself like I want to defend Miyazaki more than anyone, because <laughs> like to me it hasn't gotten I don't know it hasn't gotten old to see what's great about his movies because I kind of only just discovered it, <laughs> um, and so yeah I like as soon as I've been in the mindset lately like Miyazaki is legitimately the greatest anime director and like really if anything. It's a shame people haven't been paying more attention to him over the years <laughs> in a weird way. Uh, I don't feel like anybody's it, been wasn't his the only anime him that's well ever enough. won an Oscar. Yeah, yeah. Spirited Away, the only. <laughs> so to say, it's that it's that he should be getting like five Oscars. He should have had, got an Oscar for Kiki. He should have got I mean, an Oscar for yeah. Totoro. He <laughs> he certainly should have. I mean, he was fucking robbed. The Wind Rises lost to like Frozen. I think like what I, the I, fuck, you know? I think Frozen was a better movie than The Wind Rises, but we can get to that later. You're a fucking insane person. <laughs> we can get to that later. That. We can get to that later. Um, All the commenters just turned on you. <laughs> well. I, I, I think I have a, some pretty good points about um, the Wind Rises and such. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm not so contrarian that I'm going to say that any of Miyazaki's movies are, are terrible or anything. You know, I'm not, I'm not that contrary. I might be a contrarian this way, but I, I'm not going to be, you know, that sort of, um, that sort of brash. Yeah. I mean, I think most of them are quite good. In fact, I think every single one of Miyazaki's movies... And even some of the old stuff he's worked on. Um, World Masterpiece Theater, if you've seen that. Um, yeah. Future Boy Conan, 
which I watched uh, just recently. Do you actually watch the whole show in preparation for this? Yes. Oh wow! Uh, I wish I had. I've, dude, I've only dude. seen the first well, four episodes. What, but what's I it love called? The, uh, the the fly. Ah oh, shit! What was the flying shit called? I don't know. I went through it in like a night. The flying ship is so cool, though. Oh my god! Uh, but yeah, I think everything he's made. What was the name of that? I'm gonna have to look it up later. Uh, I think everything that Miyazaki's ever made is worth watching to some extent. Um, yeah. Uh, I personally own a large collection of his storyboards, or at least you know secondhand copies of it. The originals yeah. are too expensive. Uh, <laughs> have you read Nasca, by the way? Yeah, the manga? Yeah. Uh, not all of it, but I've read part okay. of it. I read like the first Good half. Enough. Um. Anyways. Yeah, if you look at his storyboards, they're intensely detailed, and the little yeah. notes he makes, and he essentially key animates every frame of the movie by himself in his storyboards. Yeah. Um, well, I think that's a huge part of um, the way he sort of sees anime, is that, like, because I've been reading uh, Starting Point, his book, uh, yeah. well, the book that just collects a bunch of, like, interviews, quotes, and stuff like that, and uh, the first part the very beginning of the book, he talks, it's like, this is a quote from him from like 1979. Like all he directed at the time was, um, future boy Conan and loop on the third, the castle of Cagliostro. Obviously he'd been working in the industry for like, uh, almost 20 years at this point. But like, he's talking about the decline of anime <laughs> because there's too many shows being made in 1979 and how like everyone's short staffed and all this stuff. But like his ultimate, um, complaint was basically that it used to be animators made a thing entirely by themselves and like that he kind of misses when animation was just like an animator has an idea and they want to bring it to life as opposed to like a committee comes together to like produce a product for for television and i think that's why he does so much on his movies is that like in his mind it's it's really just him making the movie you know other people are just kind of like facilitating his ability to make a feature length film or something. That's how it feels, you know? Um, I think he still kind of sees himself as like making it, making, making, just making whatever he wants entirely by himself. And it just so happens that what he wants to make is incredibly marketable, you know? <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong, I completely agree with that sentiment. Um, and I wanted to get into that in a bit. But um, you're right, though. Like everything he's made, he's made a lot of money. It has been fantastically. I can't. I can't remember the last time like a Ghibli movie directed by Miyazaki that got like a negative critical response. Well, I guess there was like Earthsea, but uh, that that was his I, son. The pa other Miyazaki. Ponyo had a Ponyo had some backlash. I would say. Oh come on! It's still like 80, 80, 80 to ninety on Metacritic or something like that. Sure, it's still it's still positive reviews. But I bet if you saw what the actual aggregate score was, it would probably be lower than most of his movies. I'm sure because I'm sure. it got a lot of flack for being too childish from from people, but, people who wanted him to make another Princess Mononoke. Mm, you know. But anyways, everything I've said though about Miyazaki, I think I could say about Mamoru Oshii that everything he's made is worth watching that everything he's made is at least pretty good and you know but people people don't spank their meat to how amazing Mamoru Oshii is or that's how, how... Mamoru Oshii has ent has books written about him like yeah, so does Miyazaki he's... but vastly more I know but, but and, uh, and, you can't, is and you like... can't deny and you can't deny Mamoru Oshii um he gets far less attention than Miyazaki. Miyazaki is considered sure. this, you know, amazing I think legend in I the would... industry and Oshii's just a really good director. I okay. I What about Khan? simultaneously you know? agree and disagree because I think that Oshii has been I think he's like probably the second most beloved <laughs> anime director. Just it happens that the distance between first and second is very vast. Exactly. That's um, my point. I don't uh, think that's to knock Miyazaki at all, though. I think that's to knock the way that media appreciates uh, anime. That Miyazaki is the only director who, who fucking any, especially in the West, who anyone knows the name of. You know, I mean, that, um, this is not an endemic to the West, though. In Japan, it's also the same thing. You know, you ask sure. anybody what anime director they know, it's you know Miyazaki. Know Miyazaki, Miyazaki well. is arguably even more beloved in Japan, where 
you know, Ghibli sure. has way more money and gets the best talent and their movies are just head and, you know, head and shoulders above the production quality of anything else right. that's being made, film or TV anime wise. I think uh, and so I th- you think to yourself, think... if somebody like Oshi or Khan mm-hmm. or Otomo with Akira, you know, if they were yeah. given the same tools and resources as Miyazaki was, they could make, in my do, opinion, far superior do you think... movies. Do you think that Otomo didn't have that level of like? I mean, Akira is one of the most beautiful films ever made. Like, I don't think it's like far below the level of a Ghibli film. It's certainly I, not of the era. It's it's definitely it's better looking than My Neighbor Totoro. Eh. Came out like the same time. I would say Akira has more more Akira, visual. Akira, Akira has a lot of um, Akira has a lot of visual flair. But if you actually look at the animation itself compared to projects that Ghibli were doing at the time, like Porco Rosso and... Um... Porco Rosso's from the 90s. We're talking about 88, 89. Akira okay, okay, came okay, out well, alongside well, 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 Totoro about, like, and Grave early, of the Fireflies. Early Grave of the Fireflies, Totoro. Um, when you're looking at stuff like that, like, I think, I think Ghibli, animation-wise, you know, they, they had people like, um, what's it called? Yone Bashi and stuff on the team. Uh... At least in the kind of talents they were able to accrue, Miyazaki's reputation certainly got him a lot further. I, I and, would, argue, and a, and a lot I would of, agree Akira, with the argument that maybe hmm? there's a couple of animators who were working on Totoro who were better than any of the animators working on Akira. I could agree with that. I don't think that was necessarily a result of like lesser budget or anything like that. I don't think it was a result of like having less at their disposal so much as just like... I don't know, a f- like maybe one or two animators who were just a little bit more technically skilled than the people working on Akira. But like Akira has insane amounts of like gorgeous animation. That's fair. That's fair. And Steam Boy was like the most expensive anime. Steam film Boy ever is made. fucking insane. And, and that was and that like, was all tumble too. So Steam Boy is maybe, a constant maybe, maybe that's an unfair gun. comparison. But yeah. At, at the same time, I think, you know, just because we idolize Miyazaki as so head and shoulders above everybody, you know, as I will some say, golden I, god. You know. I think, here's the funny thing, though, mm-hmm. and here's why I, I simultaneously agree and disagree with you. Mm-hmm. I do think Miyazaki is overpraised um, by normies. Like, I think normal people know who he is. Everyday people know who he is, and including in Japan. You know, like, in, in Japan, everybody knows who Miyazaki is. But they don't know who Oshii is, and that's because they're not anime fans. But, like, anybody who cares about the medium would know who all these other directors are. And I think, in many ways, um, anime fandom and and perhaps anime creators have undervalued Miyazaki because they see him as something else. And I know that's how I felt coming up in anime. Like, as, as a fan, I always saw Ghibli as, like, not anime, almost. You know, like, oh, that's that's just another world. Like, there's so much higher quality, and they're, they're aimed at, you know, a broader audience. But when I actually watch Ghibli films, I don't think they're really aimed at a broader audience. They just happen to reach a broader audience. But, like, Miyazaki is certainly an auteur filmmaker. Like, he's not doing shit because it's what will sell. It just happens to sell because he has that reputation, you that's know? That's true. That's true. But... Let me ask you this. What do you think defines a great filmmaker? Oh, I don't... There's no easy answer to that for me. Do you have one? I mean, I I was just asking your opinion. Just give me what comes off the top of your head. What do you think are important qualities, or what do you think makes somebody deserving of that? Oh, that's a hard question. What, What I think makes a great filmmaker... I mean, I would... I would say a combination of, like technical ability um like understanding of your craft okay i would say a great filmmaker is somebody who has like a vision for what they want to make and is capable of executing that vision to the best of their abilities okay is like i and, don't and know that, is michael bay a fantastic filmmaker i would say um i well, would say what i'm no. talking about what i'm talking about is not just a good filmmaker but like a truly legendary filmmaker yeah like we talk about i Miyazaki. would say michael bay isn't and i'd say that's because of the fact that the techniques he uses are not necessarily the ones that will get the best result at the genre he's trying to like he he makes action movies but i think that his frenetic style while it 
it creates that bayhem effect, but I don't think it like actually conveys interesting action and engaging um, action scenes. You know, I ah, feel like so. It... So so then there's another def quality to that definition. So it yeah. has to be somebody with the skill and the vision to do something they want, but that they also have to understand what they're doing. And they have to yeah. use appropriate things for that style or that tone. Like you can't, you can't yes. make Pearl Harbor and, and turn like you know a <laughs> war story into a romance, right? Yeah. Ah, I but that's exactly what he, what Miyazaki did with Wind Rises. <laughs> I don't think the Wind anyway. Rises is a romance at all. I, in fact, I, I, I think it's, like, I think like, it's like, almost <laughs> weirdly aromantic and like uh, clinical in a way that's actually kind of off-putting to me. Um. Mm -hmm. Because the way that it portrays, the way it portrays everything really is like the just facts of this guy's life. I don't, the Wind Rises is like a super autistic movie to me. Well, I mean, he did cast Hideaki, Hideaki Anno. Anno, but, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think but, that was on purpose. Um, <laughs> let let me that. get that to a, that a bit. I have something I wanted to say about that. Um, okay. But yeah, as I was saying, to me at least what I define as a great filmmaker is somebody who has the skills and the technical know-how and, you know, the appropriate understanding of what he's working with. But yeah. I think that just makes a good filmmaker. I think what okay. makes somebody truly legendary is somebody who elevates the medium, who makes mm -hmm. outstanding and long-lasting changes, stuff like, you know, Orson Welles, um, you know, or Steven Spielberg, somebody who changes the film whatever medium he's working in and yeah. constantly challenges himself and these last two traits are what i don't see in miyazaki i don't you see, don't think that he I, changed the medium i don't think that his impact on the medium is the same as somebody like tomino somebody like dezaki somebody like even Oshi. i think um, i think you're looking okay here's why i think that this is what i really wanted to argue with you about mm -hmm. is this this thing here First of all, I think the reason that Miyazaki didn't have the impact that you might expect is that nobody kind of had the balls to copy him or could copy him. I think no, that No, no, no. I think I think a lot of people have tried to copy Miyazaki and uh, failed miserably. And I think that's because of the fact that they copy Miyazaki with thinking that he is this, you know, golden god, this paragon, you know, the apex of animation if you will. And they, they don't realize many of the very real issues that Miyazaki as a director, and especially as a writer, has. And so when, when they brainlessly just copy what Miyazaki did, thinking, oh, I'm just going to be the next Miyazaki, you end up with Hoshi no Okodomo, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I, know, I know you hated that movie, right? Yeah, it's fucking yeah. terrible. Terrible, But terrible. I, I think when I look at – because this is what I've been feeling as I, as I watch Miyazaki films lately. Because I've been watching uh, just – I mean uh, – I have seen ass loads of anime and I've been watching tons of movies. And as I watch Ghibli films next to basically anything else, all I can think is like, nobody fucking has touched this guy yet. Like you this think? dude's made stuff that I don't think any other director, any other anime studio has like put out something that's been as perfect as a Miyazaki film. And so to me, I see it like, yeah, maybe he hasn't evolved as much as I would like, but who's pushing him to, you know, I, like, where's his competition? I think he has a lot of competition, really. Um, Who do you think is a, comp a competitor for Hayao Miyazaki? Well, let me first get into where I think Miyazaki's failings are. Okay. Um, well, first and foremost, I, I want to talk about Miyazaki as a writer instead of as a director. Okay. I, which I think is, in, in a large part, where most of his failings comes from. Um because the man has been known to not actually write any script until they are in the animation stage of production. Yeah, but <laughs> there's this weird tradition in Japan that directors are expected to also be the screenwriters for whatever they're working on. And, you know, that's all especially true with Miyazaki. He's been the writer on basically every film he's worked on. Some of them have been adaptations, but, you know, he's a very prolific writer when it comes to his own movies. Yeah. And the first, first and foremost, I think that's a terrible habit the industry needs to break out of. I don't think uh, there's that much of it anymore. I think that's. More I, I think there's still plenty. You look like somebody like Mamoru Hosoda, who's a fantastic director. Fantastic director. Um, when it comes to putting together like dense emotive scenes, uh, he's very, very good. 
Mm-hmm. When you unleash him, when you unchain the man, and you just let him write, uh, um, and write whatever he wants. Because his first movie is um, Tokikake, uh, the girl who left through time. I guess I guess people want to know about that name. Um, well, his first girl... movie is a Digimon movie, but uh, well, yeah, man, yeah, first original movie, uh, yeah. and Summer Wars. Uh, they were they were all written by somebody else. They were all written by um, I think her name was Psycho something. I can't remember. I don't um, know. But they had another writer, and you look at that, and you look at the difference between, like, Boy and the Beast, and it shows. You you let the guy go unhinged and unleashed, and he just makes a furry fetish movie because he really wants to. <laughs> uh, and so I, he wrote I, that himself. I didn't even he know He wrote that. that himself, yes. <laughs> of course he wrote that himself. <laughs> I have I still haven't seen The Boy and the Beast but yet. I, I think kind of the same issue applies to Miyazaki, where everybody respects him too much. And he's been at the helm for so long that he's developed these endemic issues to him and his writing style. So and what are they? What are these issues? Well, before I decide his, if I agree with you or not. When it comes to his writing, I think the man cannot write character arcs. I think the man is very, very bad at writing character arcs. His Give me characters, examples. His characters tend to start very flat and unemotive. Um, like, God, I... I a lot of give the me examples. Are, okay, give, give me you, examples. Give you examples. Give you examples. Uh, for example, whenever he's working on a wholly original story, he falls back into very similar templates. There's always a child protagonist. I mean, we could talk about every single Ghibli movie there. Um, yes. Some bad guy who's, you know... Well, Wait, actually... Give me, give me an example of a bad character arc. A bad character arc? Um, all right. Let's talk about The Wind Rises there, all right? Okay. All right, let's talk about The Wind Rises there. Uh, I think The Wind Rises was Miyazaki's attempt to break apart from the mode of what he usually does, which is, you know, the man usually does, you know... Um, well, well, for the first part of half of his career, he was making copies of Future Boy Conan, and then after Princess Mononoke, he was making copies of, like, Spirit of the Way. But... Um, when it comes to Wind Rises, that was the most original movie he's put together in a long, long time. And when I went into it, you know, and what it was advertised as, I, I was expecting this careful, you know, character drama about the pursuit of beauty and the challenges that artists face to get them. Mm-hmm. And I think that's kind of what the movie was going for, but it got lost in itself. And it just ends up being the first half of the movie being about um, a guy masturbating over airplanes. And the second half of the movie is a mediocre love story. Uh, and I, I, I think that's, you can't deny. Like I the, think the you came half, into that movie with movie. expectations that were different from the ones I came into. And I don't remember feeling that way. Well, in that case, I mean, I just feel like the movie doesn't tell a very cohesive story, right? Because how does, I, the, so how does, the, how does the sentimental love story tie in with the first part of the movie? Which I is mean, for what it's worth, it's meant to be a biopic. It's not a movie that's telling But it's not a biopic, concise... though. It's not actually a biopic. It's completely fictional. It's a story of a real guy's life. The, the, it was... it's, a, it's a fictionalized story about the real guy's sure, life. Sure, but it's, the real, it's the a real fictional guy, the real guy, The real guy lived to be 80, his wife did not die, and he was like a perfectly happy dude. My, my point, though, in calling it a biopic is that it is paced like a biopic. It's paced like just showing you this man's life from point A to point B of... When he started, when he got the idea that he was going to make planes up until when he stopped making planes. And it's sort of the story of how does he make it from that point to that point. You know, that's what the arc is. It's, and it's, it's, it's in many ways, it's not an arc that happens in small, like it's not a gradual arc. It's really more of an arc that takes him all the way to an apex of making planes and then cuts it off right there when he realizes that these planes have been used for, you know, killing see, everybody. See, that's, that's the thing I hear about the movie, and that's, again, how I went into watching the movie. But then you watch the movie and you realize it doesn't actually really address these topics at all. The, the guy kind of hears another person say, oh, hey, these planes are going to be used in the Pacific Oh, War. yeah, no. And these planes are going to be... Think that's... There, there, were, there were, like, two lines of dialogue referencing that fact, and then the guy just decides, hey, you know, my wife is dying of consumption, let's go with her. Uh, to me, to me uh, that's a very, very bad way of putting it. This is why I called it an autistic film, and I think <laughs> it's because what, what I see in this character is that the point 
kind of, is that he closes out all of that. That he doesn't care about all the other shit that's happening that's surrounding him. He just cares about making planes. And at one point cares about this woman, you know? But, like, the kind of person he is, it's the single-minded devotion to a thing that he's passionate about that he can't see past and at no point does he even question it until it's so blindingly obvious that this was a bad idea that he can't do it anymore you know and i think that's i think that's why for instance that hideaki hano voices him it's like he's meant to be representative of the creator and i always took this movie as miyazaki writing about himself like that was how I felt the first time I saw it. Um, although oh. I think it's hilarious that that he continually writes in that you're only uh, you you only truly have uh, artistic talent for ten years, <laughs> and I it's funny that this is your argument essentially is that he's not evolving anymore because I would say that he agrees. Um, I would say he accuses himself of that in The Wind Rises, that's, saying that's there's good. only that's 10 good. years it's you can actually be good. It's good that somebody criticizes uh, Miyazaki, even if it is Miyazaki. Sure. But if that's the point that you're making, I don't think that should be told on sort of a meta-narrative level. If the point of the movie was, let's make this movie abruptly jarring, and that's the point of the movie, and that can only be understood on a meta level, then to me that's an inelegant movie. You know, com- compare this you, to uh, you could call it inelegant, but it worked no. really well for me. <laughs> compare this to um, Porco Rosso. Did you watch that? I still haven't seen Porco Rosso. It's the uh, only one okay. I haven't seen. Yet. Uh, do you mind if I spoil it? Uh, go ahead, I guess. <laughs> okay. Uh, my apologies if this ruins your viewing experience. I I know you're not somebody who cares about spoilers much, though. Um, not particularly. In Porco Rosso, there's a very very similar conflict. Uh, it's, it's about this guy in the pursuit of an art, which is, you know, flying his plane, and the issues he has to deal with. He hurts the people he cares about. There's this woman that's in love with him that he ignores because of his, you know, thing for flying. Mm-hmm. Um, there's the fact that these planes are used for war, and they're symbols of violence, and people get killed. He's like a bounty hunter. And, you know, a big part of the movie is just him trying to deal with that, and deal with the fact that, oh, I'm... These planes are terrible machines of war, but they're also so beautiful. It's, it's a very similar sentiment to, well, at least what was intended to for Wind Rises, I think. Okay. But the, the movie tells it in a very elegant way. It uses So Miyazaki these... already made that movie, so why make the elegant one again? I mean... You could say that, but that's not an excuse for, you know, just the you could say, the see, poorly, poorly but produced But what is movie. an excuse, this is the way I see it. Uh, I don't think any director has to make all their movies good, or even necessarily escalatingly better. What I do think they need to do is stay ahead of the curve. I agree. I, I think Miyazaki agree. has always been ahead of the curve, and I think that the reason his career starts to look stale is that no one's made him change no one's forced him to evolve there hasn't been a big enough evolution in anime in the time that he's been involved with it that he would have to change massively and like really think about you know what he's doing like i I don't think he's ever i can't imagine miyazaki looking at anything that any young animators are doing today and going like wow that's really impressive and that's the future and maybe part of that is because he's a curmudgeonly old man Maybe he's just not that visionary. Maybe he's stuck in his ways. But, like, I can't imagine him looking at anything happening right now and being, like, impressed with it. Compared but when you're to his talking own work. about ahead of the curve, and then you're saying Miyazaki's not embracing these new things, part of, part of being ahead of the curve is being experimental and adapting new techniques. Sure. And I mean, Miyazaki, I, I will say Miyazaki, if there's... Miyazaki, as a writer and as an animator for the past 30 or so years, you know, yeah. has, has been tremendously consistent in both a very good and a very bad way. Like I was saying earlier, for the first part of his career, basically every single movie he made was some variant of Future Boy Colden. I totally um, disagree with that, but... It was... It, it's a... Usually... In what way uh, is ch- My Neighbor Totoro similar to Future Boy I Conan? I said basically everyone. It basically... Everyone. Basically, so... What? So, Nausicaa. So basically so, means like Lupin, four out of Lupin, five or something? Lupin, like, um... Yeah, basically four out of five. I think... I think... Lupin, uh, Castle Cagliostro, um, Laputa... Uh, How is Lupin like like Future Boy Conan? It's just a Lupin the Third movie. It, well, it, it's a little different from a usual Lupin the Third movie. But... It's not that different. Okay. I've watched a so, bunch of them. It's not that different. 
it's Secret it's basically of, uh, a Lupin movie. And and Nasca, if you, I mean, the manga is like an I'm epic not talking war about the story. Manga. I know. I'm just the saying manga. That the anime is basically just a truncated version, though. You not know, like quite. I, I'm just talking about characters and story structure here. Uh, for the first I, part of this I really career, see. I definitely see stuff like Nasca as having been heavily influenced by the World Masterpiece Theater stuff. Um, like, you know, I def or not even just that, but also the early Isao Takahata films. Like I see Nasuka more as being like, uh, Horus Prince of the Sun than like yeah. Future Boy Conan, you know, which of mm. course Miyazaki worked on. I, but, I, um, I think, I, th I think they're all fairly similar in a way or another. And I think a big part of that is influenced by this stuff they did on Future Boy Conan and, um, World Masterpiece Theater because sure. there, there was this thing for these adventure stories, but in, but I, in those, I really in those think movies, that as of... I think mm -hmm. as of my neighbor Totoro is when Miyazaki came into his own and was I like think that was I think that was a fluke at the time, but like in anticipation for a type of filmmaking he would take up in the future because Totoro that was pretty early in his career. Not um, really. Totoro fairly. came out at the end of the eighties. Like that's pretty I'm, fucking deep. Eh. Dude's been working in anime since the sixties. Eh, that's true. That's true. But I, either way. When I'm talking about Conan, what I'm saying is um, there's usually two protagonists, a young man and a young woman, and they discover, like, an ancient secret of some sort, and the villain's connected to it somehow and wants to use it for evil. And this ancient secret is generally something that goes against nature and the natural way things are. And then the, the villain, in his hubris, he dies or run off, runs off, and the story ends with a moral about how great nature is and how you need to live in harmony with it. And if you think about it, that pretty much describes the stories of Conan, that describes the story of uh, Casa Cagliostro, that describes the story of Laputa, uh, and Nausicaa. So it's like, sure, that's essentially the kind of plot arc he was working with. That's what that's what he was doing. His career. That's that's not the first half though. That's like the first five years of his career. You're you're not accounting for that in the late '80s. He does Totoro. Next after that, he does I think Kiki's Delivery Service, Porco Rosso. You know, then he eventually does Princess Mononoke, which is more like those previous ones. Like, he's sort of getting back to his roots in a way. I think Then he Mononoke. does Spirited Away, goes in a totally different direction. Uh, and then Hell's Moving Castle is often accused of being just Spirited Away, like, again. I don't think Ponyo is at all similar to Spirited Away, and certainly think, not the one I think Rises. Ponyo is very similar to Spirited Away. I think, actually, um, Mononoke was like a shifting point were this new kind of style of Miyazaki filmmaking that you Maybe see even a, a turning point, since yeah. that's the name of the book that starts after <laughs> that point. Literally, it's literally that's what it is. It's from, from Mononoke onwards is turning point, whereas the first book is starting point. I think Mononoke was for um, Miyazaki a very innovative movie. Um, and I think it's a nice way of kind of bridging between these two eras of Miyazaki filmmaking. In, Mon in Mononoke, we see a villain who isn't just outright evil, you know, and is yeah. even, even sympathetic, and that becomes a theme that he has in you know, most of his later movies. Um, you see him experiment with digital animation, which, in a way, was kind of a brief love affair. Um, and you see a more sort of nuanced think, approach uh, to storytelling. I think from that movie onwards, I think all of his movies have more digital stuff than people give them credit for oh yeah sure 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 but like, like people people make that, it out like he's point, like, like anti cg coloring. or something no no past that point digital color and composition was the norm with everybody yeah more or less but you know past that point i think his movies shift into kind of another form sort of formula you usually have like a young child who's put face to face with supernatural forces and they romp around and learn about themselves and rather than being an adventure story it's more about an inward journey about growing up and the love interest think, is usually bland as all hell. I don't think Ponyo's this, like that at all, though. What? Ponyo's exactly like that. And the stakes are low, there's, and there's... No one... The no one has is to, always redeemed at the end. No one in Ponyo has to learn about themselves. There's no... There is no character arcs in Ponyo. Ponyo what? is just... No, well, okay, Ponyo, Ponyo herself, Ponyo, Ponyo, Ponyo herself, her character arc is literally the defining part of the movie. At the end, when her dad asks her, Hey, do you want to be a fish or a human? Like... That basically is summing up the idea of the movie. But she would have wanted to be a human from, like, literally the first 20 seconds Which is of the why film. it's a bad character arc. <laughs> it's It doesn't need a character arc. Ponyo was uh, not a, a movie a, that a, requires a movie character that arcs. doesn't need a character arc? 
you know, a story about characters doesn't necessitate that the characters grow or change in no, some way. No, I don't think that's even remotely necessary for a movie. I think I think that's a very necessary part of a movie. I, I think don't... that without without the sort of empathetic character and without, you know, you can like have an inward... empathetic character who doesn't change. Characters don't have to change to be interesting or or they empathetic. They don't necessarily have to change to be interesting. I agree, but when you're talking about like a any sort of storytelling like this, that the characters are going on a journey and they're having an adventure, there has to be some of, some sort of inward change. I um, don't. And I, I think don't think so. And I think the lack of that is the reason why I personally was not that invested in the movie, because it just kind of felt like it went nowhere. The characters didn't oh, develop as people. Ponyo, they didn't change all that much. Ponyo it, it, doesn't go see, anywhere, but that's what I like, like about. It. <laughs> see, I feel the what I like about Ponyo is that it is it is just a movie of 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 just love like that's all it's about it's just about these two kids it's, it's just pure love with no questions asked there's but no like conflict then it, then there's it's, no then it's just so meaningless if, if there's you're life is to... meaningless econ oh, shut up it's miyazaki <laughs> a nihilist now is this is <laughs> no but... he believes in love and i believe when, when you, when love have... gives meaning to to life Love you know? is not just a word you can tack onto something, and it's no, not but just it's, an abstract I think it's, concept you can stick on I the think characters it's and be pretty like, clear. they're in love, they're in love, and this is perfect love. I no. think that's the point. Love, of... love is love is the way characters get to know each other, the way they affect change on one another. You know, Ponyo the way and their Sosuke, feelings drive them. Ponyo but, and Sosuke have what I would consider to be the what makes their love so entertaining to me is the fact that neither of them really like both of them are just so in incredibly interested in what the other has to offer there's never a moment where they're like oh that's questionable or like oh i don't know about this or like a conflict in the relationship what they they just happen to like everything about each other and so their relationship just goes off without a hitch there's no need for conflict because I, 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 they just love each other you know well, there's I, nothing I, I, more I think to there it. is sort of a need for conflict there and i think the lack of which is Kind of what makes it it a might bother a lot of people. Movie. It doesn't doesn't bother me. That's not I, the I'm way sure, I, I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm you know, sure. I, li I, I'm I like saying... living in a conflictless world. <laughs> you know, I'm sure Miyazaki does too. But no. what I'm saying is that that fact makes the movie thoroughly less interesting. It dehumanizes the characters. Well, to me, it doesn't I, I dehumanize them to me. I think I think it makes well, them can, more can, relatable. Can you, remember, to me. can you remember any feature of Soulsuke? I can tell you literally every frame of that movie, dude. I've seen I mean, it I mean, a lot of times. I mean, tell me about his personality. What are his quirks? What uh, which like? one? Sosuke or Ponyo? Sosuke. What is he like? Sosuke what is are his very, hobbies? He's very diligent. He loves his mom a whole lot. And he loves both of his parents a whole lot. Um, has a lot of respect for his dad, who's a Navy officer, who he, like, even though his dad's not really around all the time, he is okay with that because he thinks what his dad's doing is cool and important, you know? Um, he... He generally is easily excitable. Uh, yeah, you're just you're just just describing any six year old though. He's like, he's a fucking six year old. I mean, I, I'm sure, I'm sure. But what is yes, it I, I may be describing. Character? What, what makes what him sets him apart? What makes him memorable? What makes it so that the audience can relate to him? What I relate to about so well, mostly just that he's such a good kid. Like he's very good natured, and he I, I, is I'm able sure, to. I'm sure, I'm sure Troy McClure would be able to relate with him a whole lot. <laughs> I want, I want to, I want you to take into account that this kid wakes up and he sees the whole world flooded, and he's like, "Fuck, where's my mom? Let's go sail a boat out into this, out into this world." When I was a kid, I was afraid to leave my house. This kid inflates a boat and sails it out into this flooded world, and he's not even scared. Like, the whole time, him and Ponyo were just like, this is fucking cool. Look at all these ancient fish that we, for some reason, know the names of. <laughs> like, it's, it's fucking dope, man. I mean, I'll agree with you there. I, I thought that part was pretty cool. Like, he was just like, yeah, screw it. Who needs, who needs to, you know, reflect yeah. on it and just goes off. And I think the movie could have used more moments like this. But... For example, I, I for example, that. at the it's end of the movie, movie end of the movie where um, Ponyo's dad asks her, hey, you want to be a fish or a human? It feels like a lot of the weight of that question is taken out because throughout the movie, we haven't ever seen this. I agree. What, what, no. what, 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 I, what, I think what, there's what one have been the central flaw. conflict. What should have been the central conflict of the movie um, yeah. was essentially ignored. I, you, I feel, you see, you see I feel the inverse in Ponyo, of what but, you feel, Econ. I feel the inverse is, of that. 
Um, and I, I, I mentioned this in my Ponyo video, that my biggest problem with the movie is that they even tried to put a conflict in it. Because the very end, I, I agree, the ending is the worst part of the film. And it's when they try to really play up this idea that, like, Ponyo has to make this huge decision and that the fate of the world's riding on it. And, like, it really comes off as, like, kind of out of place in this movie that up until this point has never really conveyed that that Ponyo has to grow as a character or make decisions, you know? So, like, to suddenly have that come up at the very end is weird. And I could see why you would think oh, the whole movie should have been changed to fit that, because it sounds like that would be the case, like if you're writing a normal movie. But I think that that's the part I would just take out. Like, I would have just had it been a conflict-free thing all the way through, and First that there all, was no character-defining decision at the end. There, there, there's no such thing as a conflict-free movie, though. There's no such thing as a story that has no conflict. Stories need conflict to operate. It's just that the conflict comes in different what ways. Is this, what, how would you describe... The story of Yokohama Shopping Log. Yokohama like, Shopping Mall? What is Shopping Log? What's the conflict? Oh, Shopping Log. What's the sh- conflict? Kaidashi Kiko. Yeah, what's the For conflict? Example, the conflict The conflict doesn't always have to be some sort of like battle between people or some deep inner, you know, dilemma. The, right. the conflicts in Yokohama Shopping Mall are not too dissimilar to conflicts in slice of life things like Seinfeld. For example, that um, story where Alpha gets the camera. Her conflict is, hey, what do I do with it? What should I do with it? You know. Sometimes what about the, the episodes where it's just like where it's just like her like sitting in a chair like watching the world? Like she's what's usually, the conflict? She's in usually those reflecting parts? on something. Like or what? The, we don't usually get told that. Yeah, there's a lot yeah, of shots there, in that there, show that are just like nature photography. Well, <laughs> nature photography doesn't constitute a story though. Those those are things that are augmented. They're calm soothing shots that enhance the story what i are, think they are that the there's bulk of the story i so think there's a if, if yokohama shopping log ends up being nothing but nature shots it ceases to be yokohama shopping log it ends up being a very colorful sketchbook um the same thing with ponyo you know it, it's a very very pretty and you know you know entertaining to watch or maybe not entertaining but aesthetically pleasing movie it's very pretty yeah. i like I think, visually I think what it goes that... for I, I've but, made this. I, I'm I'm known for this argument, but mm-hmm. I I think aesthetic is narrative in itself. I, I agree. think I agree, but I don't I think, think that the narrative component of Ponyo has less to do with the character arcs and their stories, and more to do with like just what the what feelings that movie instills in the viewer is more of it, what is. But then it's just a very expensive it. tech demo. That's fine. Tech that's, demo. That's fine. That's fine. If it's if a you tech wa- demo if, if that you hits you say... at the core of your soul, then that's completely fine as a if great you, movie. If you want to appreciate the movie as, you know, a extended painting, you know, or, or you know, uh, some sort of animated watercolor, you know, that that's fine. But I think if you're looking at it in such a way that, you know, you're you're looking at it as a story, as a, you know plot about characters and events do you think that, that happen. Do you think that a great film has to tell a great story? Not necessarily. But I don't think you can be half-assed about it. I think you either go all the way or you go none of the way. You either create something extremely expressionist and experimental or you create something that actually has a story to tell. I, think, I, think, that's Pon- little, I think that's a little I, I, I think I think Ponyo kind of walks the line between the two. I, I'll like, admit, I wish... I In some ways, I wish Ponyo concerned itself less with having a story just a, just a little bit i don't think it needed to be like totally art house but i do wish that it concerned itself less le- with less with having a story so that people wouldn't get the wrong idea about it like even then though even then though i think i, I don't necessarily think having a story goes against goes to the detriment of your whole aesthetics as narrative thing though no, 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 no. In, in fact, the, in fact, the best movies are ones where they're used in unison, and a strong aesthetic narrative is used to reinforce themes and ideas and the plot itself. Uh, that look can at Spirit, be true. Look at Spirit of the Way, for example. You know, yeah. I, I honestly thought that movie was, you know, I still think it's a fantastic movie. Yeah. I, and you look at the way the character develops, and you realize that the aesthetics of the movie reinforce that fact. Um, sure. Chihiro starts the movie as this kind of whiny brat. And then through hard labor at the bathhouse, she becomes more responsible, more adult. And when she goes back to her parents, you know, at the very end of the movie, she does so a changed person. And that's what we can relate to. 
that that's what makes it empathetic. That's what makes it a story where like, oh man, Chihiro, something bad happened to uh, Chihiro or Sen or whatever. You know, that makes us feel bad. You know, she but is... I relate to the characters in Ponyo. Eh, I relate. To... I, I I think you might be the minority in that. I no, I am the minority. I know <laughs> that. I'm just saying that for me, it is a perfect film. Like it it in and, and I think, hmm? I think Sorry, almost everything, down? almost Can't any piece of media can be perfect Hello? for someone. You know, did even you... if it's just that that person has such a low media literacy that they don't, they just can appreciate a lot of bad things. You know. But like, I I do think Ponyo's Hello? a movie that I, I I kind of apologize for. It's not a movie that I consider to be like, oh, everyone's gonna see why this movie is amazing. It's much more personal, you know, than other Miyazaki films like Spirited Away, which like, yeah, anyone can tell that that's a masterpiece. You know, okay, I didn't I didn't I didn't hear like what you said for the past like however long. Oh um, goddamn, your audio bugged out. Yeah. Well, it wasn't important. <laughs> <laughs> All but, I was really saying was that I appreciate mm-hmm. why Ponyo is more of a niche thing that appeals to me personally. Oh, um, sure, sure. As sure. opposed but, but, to Spirited Away, I, which I, I do I think, think is... I think you should understand why people might have complaints about that movie, too. Certainly. It's not hard to understand why people would complain about Ponyo. That's, that's, uh, 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 of the anime I consider favorites, there are few that I don't think um, most people would not like agree or masterpiece oh yeah sure I, I i still don't understand why you like cycle pass but um i've made like a hundred videos about it so if you really want to get watch none of them if you really want to go down that rabbit hole um but yeah you know spirited away as i was saying that there's this whole story arc you know there about this character yeah. that develops and that makes her empathetic ultimately when we watch a movie we, we want more than the visuals we want more than the atmosphere we want, depending uh, on who you we are. Want, well, depending on who you are. But, you know, for the general audience and for human beings in general. And what so film directors should... To, are we trying to make the ad- argument of whether or not Miyazaki should be, like, widely heralded as the greatest anime director? Because, like, if you're... If the argument you're trying to make is there are other directors who are more deserving of the level of, like, mainstream acclaim he has, then I could get your argument better. No, no, my argument from the beginning was always that um, Miyazaki has flaws. He should mm-hmm. not be treated as a everyone has sort of pinnacle of animation. And as I mentioned, these flaws are things like character arcs. I believe his uh, lack of innovation, and ultimately, I do not think he is somebody that should be imitated. And I'll get to that in a bit. But I, I will agree. I agree that he shouldn't be imitated, but I mean that on in like a in on its face kind of way. Like I think the problem with, for instance, the children who chase lost voices is that it's not imitating Miyazaki's ethos; it's just imitating the very bare bones oh, elements. I, of I, his I don't aesthetic. think like, Miyazaki's yeah. ethos should be imitated either. Um, That's where I disagree. I think there needs to be more people who are willing to go. It, totally insane on making what they consider a I perfect agree. product. I agree, you know? and I don't think Miyazaki does that enough. I, I think Miyazaki's uh, approach to creating anime is kind of like the approach that Jiro Ono has towards making sushi. He believes that by holding his craft, by sealing himself in a room, and you know, just chopping the little fish into bits, he can make perfect anime. Right. And I don't think that's a proper way to go about it. I, I you know what, I agree, I think when but you're, when you're talking about any sort of art like this, uh, it, it's it's not a work of, you know, he's you're not trying to draw a perfect circle. You're trying to make yeah. something that will rel- people will relate with, that will affect people, and here's, that will be aesthetically pleasing. Here's what I think, and you can't do that without the input of others, and you can't do that without constantly trying new things and changing yourself. Here's what Com- I think compare, compare me, Miyazaki. Uh, huh? Here's what I think would make me come around to your side. Okay. If there was a director who I thought was consistently making better films than Miyazaki, then I think it would be easier for me to say like this dude's doing things wrong. Not I think I, there is. I think there is. Who is? Who Takahata. What? Isao Takahata. Isao Takahata. I don't I like believe... his movies. <laughs> I mean, that's fine. But a, a lot of his movies are very period and people specific. They don't tend to have that's the same true. kind of international appeal that Miyazaki's movies do. Uh, however, I do believe they're solidly better movies. Takahata goes out of his way to try new things, 
He's never sticks himself to a genre. He const he constantly switches between different sources to adapt and different kinds of stories to tell and different demographics and genres. One minute he'll be making Grave of the Firefly, and the other minute he'll be making a movie about raccoon balls. Um, yeah. I'll but, agree that he's more innovative than but Miyazaki. When when you come to his work, you see that this is a man who's never satisfied. When you watch something like Omoi de Poro Poro, you see so much experimental stuff that he's doing. Lightening the corners of the uh, frame such for that nostalgic feeling. Yeah. Or creating a scene that's five minutes focused on eating pineapple. I mean, can you imagine Best Miyazaki doing something movie. like that? Yeah, I agree. I agree. But it's that kind of subtle characterization that I think that Miyazaki yeah. tends to lack when he's doing something. He, he doesn't kind of put in this effort to make people empathetic with his characters, to get people really into the heads of the characters. He's much more concerned about moving the story along, the fantasy, and the atmosphere of it all. Not to say that he hasn't. I, th I think the character arc in stuff like Spirited Away and Porco Rosso was terribly interesting. Uh, the way Porco Rosso starts at the beginning, and because, you know, it almost feels like a meta some sort of Hemingway-esque metaphor for the lost generation of World War One for Porco Rosso is kind of disillusioned. He's like, I don't need to participate in human things. I'm a pig now. I'm above all that. Pigs are clean animals. And then at the end, you know, kind of very, very, very blatantly, he says, hey, you make, I, I feel good about humanity now. And then there's a scene at the end of the movie that, you know, spoilers, he turns into a human. But uh, I, I don't think Miyazaki is above that. I think he's done that before. But... Unlike Takahata, who's constantly experimenting and trying new things, everything from Kaguya to um, a war story about kids dying in war, and um, then like adaptations of comic strips and you know stuff like that, there is a man that even Miyazaki looks up to, who yeah. is never satisfied with himself, who has access to the same talent and. Do you think that he's made? as good of movies as Miyazaki, though. Yes, I do. However, and this is what I wanted to get to, I think he doesn't, unlike Miyazaki, he doesn't shelter himself, and he takes great efforts to understand his audience. That's why yeah. when you look at his movies, they're so obviously directed towards a Japanese demographic. You expect anybody in the West is going to understand why uh, Omoide Poro Poro is a powerful movie? When they don't understand the culture that goes I think, around it. I think Omoide Why? Poro Poro is the easiest of his movies for a Western audience to understand. I don't know to expect a Western audience to understand fucking Pom Poco or oh, yeah, Pom Kaguya Poco or, uh, Kaguya <laughs> or My Neighbor the Whatevers. Uh, yeah. Or, or yeah, uh, Grave of the Fireflies. I, I think that's part of the reason why his work is undervalued. It's because there's not that cultural background. And he's designing these movies specifically. But Miyazaki, to as you have said, background. is more beloved than Takahata even in Japan. It's not as though. Takahata's making like like oh the Japanese think he's literally God but the Americans don't know jack that's true. shit. That's true. I'm not gonna deny that. What I'm saying is that when he makes a movie, he makes it with people in mind. He sure. is not so he is an auteur, sure, but he's not so auteur as to ignore what message he wants to tell mm. and what kinds of stories he wants to show to people. Uh, he makes things clearly with this kind of message or emotional resonance in mind, while Miyazaki seems more interested in pursuing things for the sake of aesthetics. And How many of Miyazaki's films would you consider to be masterpieces? Hmm, that is, that's difficult to say. I would say three. Which ones? I would say Spirited Away. Okay. Porco Rosso. Mm-hmm. And um, Laputa. I would consider My Neighbor Totoro... And Ponyo, but that's, you know, that's me. Yeah, and The Wind Rises. And, I, I, and I mean, Princess I, 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 Mononoke. I've pointed out my complaints about Wind Rises already, but again, it, it comes down to, I think that... How many of Misao what... Takahata's films do you think are masterpieces? Most of them. <laughs> um, like, I think Wind Rises were, like, a more Isao Takahata touch would have helped, because I don't, I don't think the character was written that well. I think we understood that he had this single-minded fascination with planes and then his wife, sure, but... Clearly, he was trying to go for something else. When you look at that last scene in that movie, and you see the character, and he's going up and talking to this guy, and he's like, in the end, was it all worth it? And the guy's like, you know, hey, we gotta do what we gotta do. I feel like that's a major theme in the movie that, you know, it wasn't touched upon. I felt like it I, was. I, I, I felt like I understood In two the lines of, like, dialogue, you know. I, I if know. it was obvious to you, I don't think the... And it was kind of like, I know what the movie was trying to say, it just didn't feel like it expressed it that well. 
For example, at the beginning of the movie, you remember that earthquake scene, right? Yeah. I think that's one of the best scenes that Miyazaki's ever done. I love that scene. It's a great scene. And I wish that, for example, if, like at the end of Act Two, when the character is like questioning his talking, you know, learns about the nature of his planes. Maybe they're, like there's an imagined scene or some actual scene where you see, um, like you know, his planes going on and bombing a city and devastating it to the same extent. I think that would have made for some like powerful imagery and parallelism, which Miyazaki is usually known for. He is usually known for this kind of powerful imagery. But in Porco Rosso, there's a scene where um, Porco Rosso is recounting his friends that died in the war and there's this this amazing scene where he tries to escape from an enemy fighter pilot and he goes up in the clouds as he sees all these planes rising through them and he realizes that they're all going to heaven it's like it's just a beautiful extremely touching scene and i don't think that wind rises had stuff like that i I, I don't think it in trying to get its idea across used the kind of powerful imagery expected from miyazaki Mm. and I, i think that's a flaw of his as a filmmaker I think he didn't plan it out to... And I'm not saying there weren't powerful scenes in Wind Rises, uh, especially that last scene. That felt like it was almost part of something that was supposed to be longer and cut out and just stuck at the end. Maybe it was. I know uh, he was getting a lot of complaints from Japanese nationalists. But, like, you know, there's... There's a lot of human drama that could have been touched on in that movie. And especially when you're using a touchy subject, like a war arms, you know... Designer and I still like, feel like, like the if point I, of the movie was like that it, you, if you don't that, if you though. choose a subject matter like this you have to understand how it's going to be received and you have to understand how to treat it delicately you're not going to make Grave of the Fireflies into a comedy you're not going to make a movie about no, but um, I think Von Braun and make it you know, I still think that the biggest you're not going to make Schindler's wind, List like. I think the point of The Wind Rises though was that it was ignoring that humanity that this character didn't have that empathy that he didn't have that that ability to recognize what was going on in the world around him. He just cared then about for, planes. Then for a director who is as talented as Miyazaki, I don't think he showed it all that well. I mean, he showed that this character cares only about planes, sure. But, like, is, is that it? Is the character just autistic about planes and nothing else? That's what I think it is. I think the point is that he's a fucking autistic then, about well, planes. How, 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 how's he challenging his perception? If the mo- point of the movie is this character is autistic about planes and he loves this. And again, like Porco Rosso, it's a very similar thing. It's about this guy's passion. But in Porco Rosso, it's challenged. You know, people are telling him he's wrong. He is running into difficulties and pursuing that challenge. And at the end of the movie, he is a changed man with a different perception. I don't you know, see that kind of development going on in The Wind All right, let me, let me for, take a – I need to take a step yeah. back and talk about something to do with film in general and why okay. I think it why, – why this movie works for me. The sort of a problem I have with with sort of uh, this the script doctoring kind of thing, like what you're doing, like looking at a movie and saying, like, here's what they could have changed to make it more effective in this or that way. I think that we approach making movies all too, making stories too similar, saying, like, here's what makes an effective story. But as a result, their stories were missing out on telling stories that aren't that don't have the same kind of satisfying and clear arcs that just have abruptness that have like you know something like the wind rises where it's one way the entire time and then at the very end it's like oh shit shouldn't have been making planes you know and i think that in many ways you know like life can be like that a lot of the time life can have these moments where you don't have a gradual shift in your perception you just suddenly feel differently because something happened you know like and I think that that movie does a good job of, like, showing that this guy wouldn't have changed his mind for any other reason. Like, it took seeing, like, oh, fuck, everyone's dead. Ah, uh, guess I shouldn't have been making fucking planes, you know? Like, there I mean, was never a reason for him to question though. it until that time because he's he doesn't see that, totally though. oblivious, you know? I, I don't think he actually ever confronts that, though. Like, again, there's, like, two lines of dialogue in the movie and then a scene at the at, end. Yeah, at the very end. Kind of, at, at, but, yeah, but that scene was kind of bit weird and bittersweet, though, because it's kind of like you see a pile of rusted plane corpses, yeah. but then you see a couple of his planes flying through the sky and they're giving him, like, a thumbs up, and then you see his, but like, imaginary mentor. At his, like, what are you supposed to take away from that? I think um, what you're supposed to take away from that is that this dude did exactly what he wanted. He lived 
exactly the way that he thought he had to, and the result of that is that he was complicit in mass death. And well, I don't he think, never I, I don't, I don't, realized I don't think that it. part. I don't think that part was very clearly explained at all to the I, audience or that's, to the characters. That's what they say at the end. That's what the ending is, is them saying, like, hey, your planes killed a shitload of people and him going, fuck. Well, guess uh, I that's, shouldn't that's have not made an, planes. A, that's not an effective way to tell that message, though. Like, you can't just be like, you know, Poochie dying on the way back to this planet or something. You know, that, that's, you, that's not... You, Yet one man's not effective filmmaking is another man's I discovered a love for Miyazaki after watching The Wind Rises. That's you know? true. That's true. I, I will have to say, though, I think you're mistaken when you're saying, oh, you could tell different stories. No, no. Stories are all the same. Like, you take a script writing class, you study film for any amount of time, you realize all these stories are basically all the same. That's why they're uh, boring. That's why everything's fucking boring. Well, then you're just tired of, like... Repetition. Then you're watching this movie as a novelty item, which is I watch every watching. movie as a novelty item because if it doesn't give me anything new, then I think, why the fuck did I just watch that? I mean, I just watched. I, I, I mean, I, I, just... I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't necessarily disagree. But what I'm saying is, even the Wind Rises, everything is formulaic. All of this stuff is formulaic. You think the romance in Wind Rises isn't formulaic? You think that you know the way this? Oh, sure, you know... but it's it's about offering me the slight, the, the slightest Rises... difference. You know. Well, it's there, about giving old, me just the that tiniest old, uh, difference in perspective. You know? There's that old adage, you know, tell the same thing but different. And at the same time, there are conventions that you generally should follow when you're trying to make an effective movie that people can relate to. I think the perspective you're coming into the movie is, this is very interesting for Miyazaki to do this. And I agree. I think that's it's a very interesting movie. I didn't movie. even think it was interesting for Miyazaki to have done it. I was just... Or even when I, that this movie was being made. When right? I was watching the movie, it was... I, I will say that it was coloring my perception that this was supposed to be his last film and that so many people were regarding it as a sort of retirement ode because of the fact that the movie is about, you know, in the end, a guy retiring from this thing he's been intensely passionate about for a long time. And so when I watched this movie, thinking of it as, like, this is Miyazaki's statement like his this is his last movie this is him saying like here's what it was like and this is how i'm going out and so that was kind of how i took it and that was why the 10 years stuff for instance resonated with me so much the characters being like you know there's only 10 years you're really creative and me being like miyazaki's been making movies for 40 fucking years what are you talking about <laughs> you know but that definitely had a lot to do with why i enjoyed the movie so much i'm not disagreeing and you know you know you can enjoy a movie you know even even if you know you think it's not perfect or if it has flaws i can't i, I, per, some, I can't some, some, i can't enjoy a perfect movie really? if it's not fun for me no no I, i'm not saying i'm not saying i mean if you're not in if it's a, not a quote-unquote fun movie or whatever i wouldn't say it's perfect but again these things are all based on perception right hmm. all i'm pointing out is that there are ways that miyazaki could have made his character development more effective that he could have you know gone and express these themes more clearly and if he does does a suitable job and it's good enough for you to enjoy and you find something about it to enjoy that's fine i'm just saying there were these parts in that this movie that were inconsistent that could have been done better and that did not meet the intended goals of its creator i just don't know if changing those things would make the movie better from my perspective Maybe like, it wouldn't. I can Maybe it I wouldn't. can say there are some things that you can tell you could tell me like if they changed this to be like this and like I can ju judge it and go okay that sounds cool or I don't know you know but like I d I didn't come away from the wind rises thinking man there was something missing there I came away from it just being like fuck that was a cool <laughs> movie you know like I I don't think and there have been like um, if I want to get critical of Miyazaki I think uh, Kiki's Delivery Service is a movie with a lot of issues um, I rewatched that recently and my biggest issues with the movie were sort of that it it has an arc but I feel like it almost belabors its points a lot uh, it's sort of I got agree. this almost episodic structure to it and we understand from pretty early on like what Kiki's problem is like what is the conflict and then we kind of just watch that same conflict play out until it gets worse and worse and worse until she finally breaks, you know? And then the resolution of it is really fast and not really satisfying because right after we've got this whole speech that she's given where she's like, I'm going to, like, 
oh, I need to, like, self-actualize and, like, think about who I want to be and, and all, all this kind of shit that she learns from the artist lady. It then suddenly just becomes, like, third act action scene and she has to save a kid and then everybody loves her. And it's like, I that's a movie where I do feel like, man, the way this movie was put together was obviously a collection of scenes more so than a movie. You know, like, they went, we have to do this scene, then we have to do this scene, then we have to do this scene, but those scenes all are saying the same thing, so it gets repetitive, and, you know, uh, it just feels like a bunch of set pieces strung together more so than, than a properly written film. Probably some of that has to do with adapting a whole book into just one movie. Well, I don't know. To, to be fair, that's kind of what Miyazaki does with all his movies. Most of them are adaptations. Uh, I mean, I think those are valid criticisms of Kiki's Delivery Service. However, I think the fact that it has a character arc at all, that it has, you know, a character realizing something about themselves, makes it superior to something like Ponyo or... I totally Tokuro. disagree. Totally, completely disagree. Because I don't find... Because, to me, a character arc just makes me go, oh, it's, it's, it's that arc that I've seen before. Like, I, I, character arcs don't impress me. Like, a character changing and growing as a person and being relatable is not interesting to me. Because that's every human being on Earth, and I hate most of them. You know? Like, I, I don't know. Everybody is a, has character arcs. Everybody develops. Like, why is that interesting? More so than, like, seeing crazy shit you've never seen before. Like, that's super if, interesting. If, if you, if you want to really get into a technical level about it, it's because when people watch a movie, they want to be able to vicariously experience things and if you don't make your characters understandable and sympathetic then they cease to be human and the audience becomes alienated of course of course if you're just personally you know mis mis misanthropic and uh, and don't like that sort of thing and you prefer to watch something that's a technical spectacle and beautiful and you know uh, or just alien and sometimes i just yeah, want to see stuff that is alien alien and <laughs> sterile and you know com completely elegant but without that kind of humanizing nature that's fine that's part of your taste what, what i'm saying is that when when your movie sets out with these kinds of goals and your movie for example in ponyo you know you clearly try to build these themes up through the movie and it fails at that um i don't know if it did i i, 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 think I don't that's know how much i don't know how much of it was like the thing about ponyo and ponyo is supposedly an adaptation of the little mermaid um, obviously it's taken hella liberties with it. I think it should have taken more, you know, like that's the, if I have any, anything I would point out as a flaw with Ponyo, it didn't need to try to ham fist in a character arc. And I think, it, I mean, I think, I don't think, I don't know if Miyazaki came at it with the intentions of like, oh, we're going to subtly hint this stuff and then pay it off at the end. I think it's more like. We got to the ending that was supposed to be there, and then he looked back and went like, oh, we didn't actually set up for this, but uh, it's got to be there because this is The Little Mermaid, and otherwise there's no resolution to this movie, so let's just tack this on, you know? Well, but then, either way, it makes it an inelegant movie. Or, at, at the very least, a movie with some number of flaws that, you know, people sure. find unenjoyable. Um, but I feel I like the caliber of things it does right are still, like, grossly above the heads of any other I, anime i never said that I, like i said i think me, all miyazaki's movies are pretty good you know yeah. I, I wouldn't even call ponyo a bad movie you know maybe i said that earlier i, I don't think it's really a bad movie so. um but i do think the fact is i don't think people should be looking up to miyazaki so much and ignoring these flaws that his film works have we can talk about whether these certainly flaws don't, don't make ignore his, his flaws that's definitely bad, fair but if you're gonna but the fact is but the fact is the man has so many blatant either uh, flaws in his movies or uh, incompetencies with his writing ability and occasionally his directorial stuff, but uh, I'll give that a second. Um, that I don't think you should be looking up to him this much. I, I, don't, I, I, don't, think... Think, I don't think you should be looking up to his movies to say, I want to write character arcs like that. I, I, want I just to... don't... Well, certainly, no, you shouldn't think yeah. that. But, like, I... I don't think he's admirable for as a writer. I think he's admirable as an animator and as a. As I will a not director. deny that he is very admirable as an animator. And I said from I, the very beginning, I think he's the greatest storyboarder anime has ever seen, and I stand by that. Yeah, he's, and that's and that's something and that's something that people downplay all the time. People don't yeah. recognize even the soccer guy people. They don't realize how important storyboarding is to a work. And sometimes no. storyboarding is everything. Um, Satoshi like, Kon's uh, movies are just his storyboards. Yeah, exactly. 
Um, uh, she, Watanabe rarely does any work aside from storyboarding. He's not an animator. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm impressed. I've seen some of the Shimbo. I've owned some of Shimbo's storyboards, and you know, he he draws circles. He draws circles. Yeah. That guy doesn't bother that does with not like, stick figures me. either. Just draw circles. <laughs> um, or or you could look at something like uh, the latest episode of Fate Apocrypha. I know you probably don't watch that anymore. <laughs> Why the fuck Where, are you watching that? Well, you know. No, I don't. <laughs> I, I watch everything. I, I watch things just to like, you know, be able to hate on it. Um, but no, the recent episode had like fa- this fantastic animation with like a bunch of NetK animators, like Baki JD and uh, uh, what's what's his face and uh, Ki and all that stuff. But like, um, the problem was I don't think it was storyboarded very well. Half the time you couldn't see what was going on in the fights. The animation and the effects were very flashy, but yeah. you can't tell the choreography oh, was bad, and you can't can tell go, what's going on. If you want to go down a rabbit hole of like shitting on Sakuga people for not appreciating <laughs> um, that animation itself isn't always making for an impressive film, that's a rabbit hole I could go down another time. Oh, that I think I think that's something we both very much agree on. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I used to be one of those Sakuga people, like I said. You know, I have a, I, I, I bought way too much of this stuff. Um, you know, there, there was a time when I thought that all that matters is that this looks pretty. Or how yeah. dare you watch an anime for the story? Don't you know it's all about animation? This is a medium yeah. of animation. And you got to well, enjoy it. But I do, th- I do style, think that, but... I think that what, the reason I, um, the reason I've been so into Ghibli is that, I think the more I understand about animation, the more impressive it is to me. Like, and the more I recognize the flaws and everything else. Like, and I mean, it it helps that I've been smoking a lot of weed lately, and it's turned me into a, a huge elitist because, like, I can process more information when I'm high, and it makes yes, Ghibli I- movies into the greatest thing ever. And any TV anime is just paltry. Like... It's funny to watch something like Made in Abyss, which uh, is often like considered like, oh, it's Ghibli esque. Like it's, oh my god, it's got like almost Ghibli level animation in places, and it's like, yeah, in in places, there's maybe a couple minutes of that in the show, but like the show on average is just a TV anime, and you watch a Ghibli movie and it's never like that. A Ghibli movie I... will never just be characters standing there with their mouths flapping open and shut. Like you will not well, see that. You know. Well, well, I mean, there there are some examples, but you know, g- generally speaking, you're right. Yeah. Um, and that's what I, I... Mean, Whisper, Whispers of the Heart. I remember had a, quite a bit of that, but and well, he didn't. That's kind of Miyazaki didn't direct that one. No, movie, so. I, I actually thought that was um, even though Miyazaki wrote the, wrote the script for that, I thought that was a amazing movie. That's probably one of my favorite Ghibli movies. I still um, haven't seen Whisper of the Heart, TBH. You should, you should. It's, it's one of the good. few I haven't seen. But uh, Oh, yeah, yeah, but uh, that, that's another thing. Miyazaki cannot write freaking love interests. He sucks at that. All the lo- I can't remember a single love interest in any of his movies that was ever actually interesting. Um, sure. The, the the Flying Boy was boring. The Dragon Dude Tobio, from... Uh, yeah, he sucks. The Dragon Dude from um, Spirited Away Haku. sucked. Haku's yeah, yeah. fine. I can't, he's just such a bland and boring he's character. He's pretty boring. No face. No face would have been a better romantic interest. What about Sosuke for Ponyo? He's great. Sosuke's I thought he was perfect. Boring. I mean, you like him, but, you know, I'm not a pedophile, so. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not either for boys. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so what the fuck I mean, was I, I talking I, about I, I mean i don't know when i, when I first right. heard may's voice uh, i thought she was a 13 year old boy oh, may's oh fuck you <laughs> she sounds like a fucking anime girl i don't know what you're talking about um anyway like anime girl quotation marks uh, you sure. were saying uh the what the fuck was i right the fact that his movies just are, are always moving there's always something going on and i really feel like he just maximizes like timing and for instance uh my neighbor totoro that movie is all about like timing it's all about like the length of shots and like reactions like characters reacting to things or just like taking a long slow tension build and then popping it into something funny like the movie is just constantly doing that and it's kind of crazy to see like 
such a consistent amount of effort put into like every shot that like no at no point do do things slow down and it's like normal for a little bit you know and i think that it's not necessarily bad to do those things and certainly miyazaki has made other films that do slow down a little bit here and there like howl's moving castle is plenty of slow parts you know granted that was like when he came in late on or whatever um but like uh for instance, I watched uh, Ninja Scroll recently, and, like, Yoshiaki mm-hmm. Kawajiri, yeah. amazing visual director, and the first, mm-hmm. like, 20 minutes of that film are just constant visual intrigue, and then it fucking just slows way down for an exposition dump that lasts, like, five minutes. And it's like, see, this is why we haven't... This is why Kawajiri is not Miyazaki, you know? Like, because Miyazaki wouldn't let that... He wouldn't let there be a 10-minute exposition dump in his movie. See, and see... No. This is something I, I think you hit the nail on the head. Miyazaki's movies are just so terribly visually consistent. However, mm-hmm. I would actually argue that's a downside. I, I will agree that the consistency of the style is a downside. No, I think no, the consistency not, not even necessarily of... that. I think I think the biggest issue here is that Miyazaki is an extreme auteur. For most of his career, he was personally redrawing keyframes and such. Yeah. Um, he, like he was actually going in and when he felt something was out of his art style he would redraw it and do it his, to his personal taste but he's changed that what, he has changed well, that not, not willingly not Shin, willingly the Shinya Ohira cuts in Spirited Away you got those weird ass cuts in Ponyo when she like transforms into this like blob thing and it was like one animator did the whole sequence I'm, I'm and pretty, Miyazaki I'm, was I'm like it's sure perfect I'm pretty sure he didn't do that willingly but he said it, it says in the art book that he saw oh, the sequence really? and thought it was so good as it is that he didn't change. I, th- I always, I always assumed he was just too tired to do it anymore <laughs> because he's wait, too wait. old. Yeah, because he's too old. But I, no, I'm the, sure that well, was there's a. a um, this is this is something I just learned recently. I still haven't seen mm-hmm. the Kingdom of Dreams and Madness yet. I've been meaning to, but um, have you seen that? The documentary. No. Um, I don't know why we I, I know recorded this when neither of us have fucking seen it, but um, there's uh this this um youtube show that's a visual analysis show you might enjoy it called every frame of painting i don't know if you've I've seen it didn't yeah. they quit recently yeah yes they just quit and they were talking about um they they just happened to mention a scene from kingdoms of dream and madness that they were a big fan of and it's a part where miyazaki is trying to draw a plane and he keeps trying to draw it for like days and day hold on can you still hear me yeah i can hear I said you said we got clipped out for a second um, anyway, Miyazaki's trying to draw this plane. He's drawing it for days, and he cannot get it right. And finally, he just says, well, I can't do it. Give it to somebody else. And, like, so he can do that. He is capable of delegation when he realizes he cannot do a thing, you know? And I think that there is... I think if you watch all his movies, there's almost always at least one scene that looks nothing like a Miyazaki movie. And you go, I think, what the hell was that? <laughs> I think when it comes to Miyazaki movies, the general attitude he has towards things is, like you were mentioning at the beginning of this podcast, this is my vision. This is how it has to be done. Yeah. But I sometimes his this... vi- I think sometimes his vision mm-hmm. includes, I want that guy's weird-ass style <laughs> in my movie. You know, I think that tends to be very rare. It's and... definitely more rare than it is for other... Anime directors. I think, I think that's I think a that huge... In anime, oh. it's usually more of a melting pot. Yeah. I think that's a big detriment against them, honestly. I think... You could again, say that. I mean, I uh, I admire I greatly source... about Hiroyuki Imaishi that he wants yeah. everyone to leave their mark as much as possible, you know? And he's like, everybody just throw your shit in there. And I think that's also no. really cool. But, but the problem is, anime is no longer the kind of um, one-person project that it was or it used to be. Right. Or even one person and, like, a dozen other people. Nowadays, Ghibli productions involve <laughs> hundreds, if not thousands of people. Um, many, many I dozens of key animators and directors. Well, I mean, when you take in, like, all the producers and auxiliary staff, yeah, probably thousands. But No. No. Uh, you sure? There cannot be thousands know. of people making a fucking... I don't, uh, they're not all animators, but when you think about, like, marketing staff, producers, editors, I, like... I don't even yeah. know if, like, a fucking... You have to make, like, a Marvel movie to reach a thousand, I think. You think? Yeah. Hmm. Okay, but th- the point is, there's a lot of people working on it now. And I think this kind of tyrannical tyrannical attitude towards her vision tends to be detrimental, because, one, 
um, Ghibli hosts so many world-class animators, you're not really giving them room to express themselves and develop as animators. Sure. And two, it makes his style wildly predictable. And kind of like his writing, because it's all Miyazaki writing it. Um, you were saying earlier that you think innovation is a very important factor, and I agree. Even if stories come down to the same core concepts and the same skeleton um, for pretty much everything, um, there has to be some amount of variation. You have to tell the same thing, but different. And when it's just Miyazaki's voice coming through in both the, at both the animation and the writing and the characters, it ends up feeling terribly consistent. It loses its ability to surprise you. You're watching a Miyazaki movie and you're thinking, gee, I wonder how this ends. Um, are they? Go- is the villain going to be redeemed, and they're going to all learn well, a big I, lesson about how nice nature is? But like the wind rises wasn't like I, that at all, though. The wind rises was just confused, um, I as I was saying earlier. Um, it, it tries to tell this story about this guy, and you know. Well, look, all, I think we hit all, on. I think we hit yeah, on the we, core we, of we, our we, debate we, here with yeah, the we, Isao we Takahata thing. The... I think that when you brought up what, like, what you want. What you want from Miyazaki is what you kind of get from Misao Takahata, and I think that's... That's true. That's fair. I think that in many ways encapsulates the the argument here. I mm-hmm. would say that my stance essentially is that while I agree that more experimentation would be better, and I really admire that Isao Takahata has done that, I feel like Miyazaki has made so many masterpiece films that no one has challenged him enough to force him to innovate and that none of the innovations that have happened have been like so game changing as to move the medium in a, in a direction where Miyazaki would look worse. You know, like I feel like he still holds up as this is the guy who has done the best work in the medium. And until someone challenges that there will be no need for him to innovate, you know, or for, for us to reflect on him as someone who didn't innovate enough um, maybe he could have, maybe if he had been the one to change anime, but like, I'm sure from his perspective, it would be like, I already fucking did it once. I'm not going to do it again. Um, Takahata obviously cares a little bit more about, you know, innovating, advancing, you know, giving voice to new talents. But in my opinion, I don't think he has produced something that is greater than the sum of Miyazaki's work, you know? So, but you keep saying these things about how Miyazaki hasn't been challenged, or he's kind of at the apex of it all. I, I, I think again, that's just c- c- ends up being biased because everybody has this perception that Miyazaki's so great, Miyazaki sure, can't be beat. It, it is everything Miyazaki makes is a masterpiece. So you don't acknowledge the flaws that his movies have, and the fact that oh, the, I think they have plenty of flaws, but everyone there are has flaws. Many, many, many other movies are superior to his. I th- because of the I fact can't. That name an anime film that i consider personally superior to ponyo regardless oh, of flaws that's fine like like, like, like I you think... know we, 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 we can all have our personal biases and our personal preferences my favorite romantic comedy of all time is a shitty thing 13 minute episode series that shaft put out back in like the early 2000s wreck. yeah wreck uh <laughs> good, what good ass show but like what do you think uh, what is there any anime film that you would consider flawless obviously not no and do you think there's I, any that are, like, what do you, what, can you name an anime film that you think is better than anything Miyazaki's made? Yeah, sure. S- such as? Such as, uh, off the top of my head, we were talking about Takahata earlier. Yes. I would say that I think Pompoko is better. Really? That's the one about yes, the, the testicles, the one about, right? The, the one about the raccoons. Why did I even bring that up? <laughs> um... <laughs> Or something like Grave of the Fireflies. I thought that movie. You had really think Pom Poco is better than any Miyazaki film? Hey, hey Pom Poco keeps a on Japanese like you know animators and uh, you know, film reviewers list of the most influential movies of all time. That movie I, I, is influential. Underrated. Might be. Yes. Look, I haven't seen Pom Poco, so I'm not going to make any statements about its quality. I've nah, never heard anyone you. say anything good about that movie though. But like, everyone I've ever known who's watched it has been like, yeah, it's just about a bunch of fucking tanukis with huge balls like bouncing around. Like, don't watch it. And I'm like, but that's okay. what's so nice about it. But uh, maybe maybe I go and guess. I think I enjoy that for reasons maybe very similar to the reason you you enjoy Ponyo. Mm. Um, let's say something like you got a thing for huge balls. <laughs> I like big. You know, my balls are always bouncing to the left and to the right. Um. But yeah, like, or, you know, 2000, um, 
was it 2001? Yeah, the Metropolis based on Tezuka's thing. I thought that was a fantastic movie too. I think, I think all it's those really, movies, dude, it's really interesting that are, you just said that. You mean the Rintaro movie, right? Yes. That's fat. I I like that movie a lot. That movie is critically panned. You know that. That movie. That movie. There's split critical opinions on it. Uh, sure. For example, I know I know um a lot a lot of people in Japan panned it, but Robert Roger Ebert also gave it like a sterling review. It, it's a very divisive movie, yeah. but for what it's worth, I think it's on par, if not superior, to some Miyazaki's best work. I love the way it uses colors. I think the story it tells is actually very touching and interesting, and I really like a lot of the subplots they got going on. And, yeah. and, and plus, 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 you know, just pers- on a personal level, you know, Ray Charles in the background. Come on. Come on. I do love that movie. Um, but I don't want to, like, I just, I can't argue against you in any way other than to say, oh, you know, that movie's critically planned. Because, like, I haven't seen it in, like, ten years, but I remember Seriously? loving it, did and you, I've been meaning to watch re- it when I came out. Yeah, you should rewatch it. I've you seen it twice, it but so both bad. way back in the day. But I've been on a Rintaro kick, so I, mm-hmm. I feel like I'm a... I'm a burgeoning Rintaro apologist. So. <laughs> but, you know, even stuff, you know, famous stuff like Akira, Ghost in the Shell 2. I, I, don't, I don't really think any of these movies, or, oh, you know, uh, I forgot to mention, Beautiful Dreamer. I love that movie. But, mm. like, I don't think any of these movies are terribly inferior to Miyazaki's top work. I think perhaps they don't have the same kind of animation budget, but they also don't suffer from a lot of the tripling flaws that... You know, some Miyazaki's movies have, like, um, what's it called? Very repetitive story plot lines or, you know, characters who are unempathetic because Miyazaki isn't really that good at writing character arcs. Um, so I feel like while those movies might have flaws, uh, I do not find that Miyazaki's movies are somehow in an epoch or, I can, no, wait, epoch is a um, it, unit of it, time. Yeah. Um, they're, they're not, a, like, a level above... Yeah, I get what you're saying. The other stuff that's coming out. And I think when you idolize Miyazaki to this extent, what you're doing is you're influencing another generation of animators to say, hey, look at Miyazaki. You know, he's done everything perfectly. You know, like you said, you don't need to improve. Nobody's caught up with Miyazaki. You know, might as well just try to do what Miyazaki does. No, yeah, I agree. That that, that in the end leads to terrible results. I don't think anybody should just idolize one person. Like, that's definitely a bad idea. You should be idolizing... Everyone doing good work. You should be idolizing yeah. multiple people. Copy yeah. as many people as you can. S- simply put, yes. You should yeah, idolize more put, than yes. one person. You should, you, should, you should copy as many people as you can. Yeah. I mean, take but. the best elements of everybody doing... Like, it's not as though Miyazaki's the only person doing amazing work. I just think no, he's done no. more of it. You know? And I, I feel like I've yet to see another entity in the world of animation, like put forth as much with the exception i don't know it but then at the same time i also think like tv anime is a whole other world and it's got its own you know because like yeah miyazaki's made a lot of great films but he's never made well he's made like one great tv show you know like but there's well, i mean there's he, people out there on, he's worked on he's worked on a number of tv shows and I don't know whether sure, how much but... I would attribute Future Boy Conan to him, because even though he was ostensibly in the lead, there was a lot of other people working on it, and the writer was what's his face. Um, it was the writer who sure, did. He, did uh... he didn't write it himself. Is the point? He didn't. He didn't write it. God, I should. I know the writer. He was the guy who did. Uh... Oh, whatever. I'll remember it later, um, or I'll look it up later. But he a very famous writer. He's a very famous writer. He I, did much I can like say like Peter. as much as I can sit here and be like, oh Miyazaki made like five masterpieces. I can also be like, yeah, but Hideaki Anno made Eva and Karekano. Like yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot of hours. That's like and, and, that's like um, twenty four for- hours of amazing. And don't forget the salary man shit. shit. Yeah, oh, Ryuse Kacho. Yeah, yeah Ryuse Kacho. That's, that's, that's also a masterpiece. Absolute Kino. Um, but. Yeah, I mean, if, if we're, we're talking about TV animation, then I think someone like Dezaki is, you know, way ahead of Miyazaki in terms of influence and... Dezaki just... through, like, sheer force of how much fucking shit he directed. But... Not even then. I think when it comes to Dezaki's best work, it's superior to Miyazaki movies. Mm. Like, I, I, I can't think of a Miyazaki movie that's touched me in the same ways that Ta- Long John Silver has in, like, Takarajima. I know you love you some Takarajima, and I, I will... That, 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 I gotta that, that watch sounds it. kind of raw, doesn't it? <laughs> but, I gotta watch yeah, it at some point. I haven't... 
I've it's seen a, a... It's an incredibly human story. It's got very well written characters, and you know, from the very first scene where the you see like a a weird color shifted scene in the rain where a bunch of pirates are swashbuckling in the dark. Ugh, like the visuals are immaculate. So, I uh, I've seen a spattering I, I... of of Dezaki stuff and. He's, Again, he's a very in, visual in any, director, but he's not really yeah. my aesthetic per se compared to the other Madhouse uh, guys, you know. But I need to watch. I his, mean, he didn't, his ju- he didn't just work at Madhouse. He no, was no, no, also I know. Like TMS and stuff. Yeah, I'm just saying but, that out of the 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 guys who founded Madhouse were like the visual directors, you know. Yeah. And like I like but, Rintaro and Kawajiri more than I like Dazaki, but um, that's true. Well, that, that's not true. That that's a fair opinion. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> Like, it is also true that I like a, a prob- them more, but <laughs> yeah, it, it is true. But you know, again, the problem is when there's so many great d- directors out there, and you isolate Miyazaki with all his—he's only human after all, right? He's not a god. He's gonna make mistakes and he's gonna have flaws. And you praise him and you idolize him to the extent that he starts believing in himself. I think. Um, I wonder like, about like, that. Like, like I when wonder. Yonebashi, I I, I I mean, when you read his interviews, he's pretty self-assured. Yeah, you know? well, I mean, <laughs> like... one of the most interesting things that I read in that, that early starting point thing was that how he got into anime was he, you know, saw uh, Haku Jaden and yeah. basically wanted which, to... Which you hate it for some reason, right? Yo, I hate that movie. I thought it was fucking oh, that... garbage. Why do you hate that movie so much? It's real it's bad. Low. But, uh, but he... <laughs> He, the funny thing about it is that he saw the movie, he was obsessed with it as a teenager, and then he got into the industry hoping to make something as good. <laughs> but then he yeah. said within a, like after about 10 years of distance from when it came out, he thought it was shit and thought he could do better. Like oh, yeah. that was that, his that, motivation that, that, was that like, sounds like Miyazaki. That his sounds like his Miyazaki. motivation was like, huh, I wonder if I could make like a way better version of that, you know? And I think he did. <laughs> but you know uh but, that, yeah as, as i was saying that's earlier, also um, though why i think like i feel like if he had felt challenged he by someone else he would have tried to break away a little bit more like if he saw someone doing something and maybe this is just him being short-sighted or closed-minded like maybe people have made things that he should have looked at and thought I, wow I that's very much agree with better that than what i did you know like um I mean, I'm not saying he should jump on, like, the Net K train or anything, but, no. like, during the late 90s and early 2000s, there were certainly a lot of experimental stuff going on with anime. Yeah. I know you like Anno and stuff, but, you know, directors and, and, that and, uh, taking and a lot Miyazaki more cinematic And Miyazaki loves, loves Anno, too, but, like, yeah, I, mean, I don't Miyazaki... know if he looked at it and went, oh, this is better than my shit, you know? He probably just looked at it and I went, mean, oh, this is the second best guy. <laughs> you know? I, I don't think he likes him that much. I know Miyazaki has a lot of respect for Takahata and a lot of other directors, but, uh... I don't think Miyazaki's the kind of guy who looks at Ev- I I'm pretty sure he's made comments about Evangelion before. I remember reading them where he said um, he didn't like it that much. Or was that I, Tomino? I can't remember. I would. That sounds like more of a Tomino thing. Miyazaki and Anno are like pals. They're like they well, like hang they out. Used to, they They're used to buddies. work together, but like I I know that in some cases Miyazaki doesn't really approve of Anno's work. And I mean Anno doesn't approve of Anno's work, so I guess they no. they could be buddies about that. Uh, but yeah, like I was saying. Um, because people respect Miyazaki so much, uh, he, he, it ends up being a very stifling work experience. Oh, yeah. Uh, when, I mean, yo, yonei, when Yonei Bayashi and Nishimura left to make Studio Ponok, I mean, this was after Miyazaki had already left, but ostensibly, you know. He, yeah. He's coming back again and doing all this shit, but um, they said that they weren't satisfied working at Ghibli because yeah. of the fact that when they worked under Takahata and Miyazaki, it was very oppressive. Like yeah. these people that will go in and redraw your keyframes. Uh, that's to what fit, the that's what the documentary is about. That's what Kingdom of yeah. Dreams and Madness is about. Is that like oh, showing I mean, you we, how? Neither fuck... of us watched it, so. <laughs> well, I, I've so, heard like... the uh, the details about it, and it's basically yeah. about how working at Ghibli fucking blows and everyone hates it. Yeah, I mean that's but, that's like, what they... that's actually what Spirited Away is about too. Like he said that Spirited like... Away, Spirited Away was about prostitutes, man. No, okay, Spirited first Away, of all, Spirited Away was about econ. prostitutes and credit cards. I don't know if you actually believe that or if you're memeing, but that's not true. And I did a lot I think, of research. I think, when, into I think it. when you, whenever you, you know, especially in a very Japanese, I don't think it's actually about prostitutes, but I think no. it's supposed to evoke that sort of imagery. Well, a young girl working at a bathhouse, it's supposed to there's, evoke there's, imagery there's, of some There's sort of definitely a little bit of that, that imagery is supposed to be in there for sure, but like, people read it like it's about prostitution and it's not. It's, well, it's about, not. like, 
and Miyazaki is like explicitly said that like his biggest influence for it was like young people who come to work at Ghibli is like what Chihiro is supposed to be. And like he he like saw it as himself as Yubaba and like he is just this oppressive slave driver. But like if you are diligent, you might find reward in working there, you know, and like that's like explicitly what the movie's about. I think that's just the microcosm of it. I think the movie is also about like you know Japanese economics and stuff, but sure, uh, that that's probably like a different discussion we could be having. Um, you have to watch my Spirited yeah, Away video before we have that discussion. I made a. You 30... keep making all these videos and you expect this everybody was years to watch ago. them. And I made a thirty minute all like, analysis all, of it. Like they're all like an hours <laughs> long, and nobody nobody has the time for that, man. It, people are gonna have the time to sit through this two hour podcast, apparently. Oh so. shit! Is it like two hours? Yeah, it's like an hour forty. One forty. <laughs> Do you well, want to wrap I, I, it up? I'm sorry. I, um, yeah, sure. Got any closing statements? Um, well, I feel like I already made my closing statements, so uh, no. <laughs> I tried to wrap it up like 20 minutes ago. We went on another oh, sorry. tangent. My bad, then. Um, we went on another tangent, I guess. It's fine. Do you have anything you want to plug here while we're here, since this is going to be probably seen by a minimum of 10,000 people? Oh, you're too greedy. You're too greedy. Uh, this is going to be seen by a minute of 2,000 people. Look at 10, the. 10,000. Uh, 10,000. Oh, wait. 10,000? Okay. Well, yeah, this is going to be seen by a minute of 10,000 people. Yeah. You think it'll get that many viewers? Absolutely. <laughs> I'm posting but, this on After Dark, which averages that much. And this is an anime relevant topic, so it could have up to 40,000, hmm. depending on who watches it. So. Do you well, have anything you want I mean, to plug? <laughs> there are, to forty thousand. Maybe I maybe I'll maybe I'll make a Etsy video soon. I did I didn't want to make a video response to your thing on Shinkai. Um so I could plug that. Put my Twitter in are the Are you gonna or make something. your own channel or are you gonna keep using Nino's channel? I'm not gonna keep using Jimmy's channel. Jimmy's channel is dead as like all hell. But um Yeah, I'll probably make my own channel. So if we if we're expecting a response video or anything from you, where should we? I guess just follow your Twitter. Everything will get posted there. Yeah, just there, follow right? my Twitter. Um, um I mean, at, I'll just probably use my current account for my channel. What's if you the want to stick at, What's the? Uh, I don't care. What's the at for your Twitter? It's like outsall o u t underscore s a l l. I for the love of me, I can't remember why I picked that name. Okay, so at out underscore sol. Follow yep. Econ on Twitter if you're curious to see. First of all, if you want to watch him fight everyone in Annie Twitter, <laughs> if you want to watch him argue with every fucking person in the Annie Twitter sphere, um, oftentimes without realizing who they are, like arguing with Miles from Crunchyroll for like hours <laughs> without realizing that he's Miles from Crunchyroll, or I'm sorry, An Annie Twitter got like they're not that relevant. I don't know you. Or, or screaming at uh, Kevin from Sakugaboru all the time. Um, or just arguing with anybody. Go follow Econ on Twitter and look forward to when he possibly puts out some response videos. Hey, we actually got this fucking podcast done, so I I believe yeah. in some things. You know. Yeah, yeah. That, we, we were gonna do this for like ages, and it just kept getting delayed. Yeah. Like you had time, and I didn't have time, and I had time. And, and hey, we'll time. probably do another one if we have another argument that we both feel passionately about enough to. Uh, oh come on! To do you know this. we will. We can have one like once a month or something. Yeah. All right. That's it, everybody. See you later.